I forgot to record this, which is very unfortunate because you guys are saying good things. Um, anyway, I will have to summarize it at the end, but um, you can go ahead and repeat some of the stuff that you said for the, you know, for the other students when they're going over this. Uh, but to the other students who have missed out on our conversation, um, the students are reacting to the outline. And um, we will keep going and then I'll try to summarize at the end. Uh, being even tempered, that's important, right? Um, not getting angry and then making a, an unwise decision. Um, since most people tend to get angry too soon, uh, it's better to be calm. And so if people admire you because you managed not to lose your temper, um, Give employees a chance to express what they're angry about, right? You could hire somebody that listens to complaints or you can have a complaint box that's anonymous. But if you had a really good company, people would not feel like they had to be anonymous to complain, right? And again, if the company is trying to cultivate mature adults, then they'll respond to that, right? They'll, they'll think twice before they get too angry because they know their boss thinks twice before she gets too angry, right? And so she's gonna treat you the way she treats herself, right? Um, she's not gonna have a double standard where she can be angry and you can't because she's the boss, right? Um, acknowledge problems, find solutions, explain to the employees, why you did what you did, uh, take feedback. Um, let's see, uh, righteous indignation is people feel like they're not being treated justly. The wrong workers are being honored and promoted. You know, that's that really undermines business climate, right? Okay, so the boss hired his son or his son-in-law or some relative, right? and that person is not competent, but keeps getting promoted. That really undermines a company and anybody who's really skilled is gonna get out of there. Um, so it doesn't pay off in the end. You don't develop a you know, sophisticated company. Sense of humor, you know, to try and um, alleviate stress, you know when to have fun, you don't, uh, don't obsess about trivial things, that's important. And then you, you create bonds, right? You encourage workers to bond with each other, to treat each other with the golden rule, to respect each other, to know how to exercise inequality. Somebody knows more than somebody, somebody's in a mentor role, somebody's a coworker, right? and they, they're more on an equal plane. Um, and this gets more and more important over time because we, societies, the technology has created highly complex uh, corporations and business and government uh, um, environments where everybody's specialized, everybody depends upon everybody to know their stuff and to explain to as much as they can what they're doing and why. Um, so you need more and more trust. You can't just, you know, take your toys and leave the sandbox and, you know, have 40 acres and a mule and <laughs> with, a, with some guns, you know? Vigilante just doesn't work. Um, so uh, there's all different kinds of abuses lots and lots of kinds of abuses. So to have employees that are self-correcting um, and report abuses could be a whistleblower that does it without being anonymous, but just recognizing that the reason why things get reported is because like this, the company is complicated. It's not because there's particularly more corruption here than other places. And if we have this self-regulating system, we'll have less corruption. 
uh, the relation between the stockholders and the managers, the workers and the customers. This is all, again, difficult because if the stockholders are super rich and really just want to get richer, a manager is like a slave, you know, he can't really, or she can't really make the judgments they want to. And if the stockholders take their stock out because you didn't make enough money and the manager says, well, I was trying to make sure nobody lost their job, right? I was trying to keep the climate at work positive. Some stockholders, you know, are going to say good because over time that's going to be a better company. And some of them are just ruthless. <laughs> um, so then you have to know, you know, if your manager actually is suffering, can't do what they really would like to do because of the stockholders or, you know, what the situation is. Um, uh, let's see, hire workers who are trustworthy, co-workers, um, you know, that don't intimidate each other, older workers, right? The relation between the generations, how to uh, respect the olders, but also they often don't know, especially when it comes to technology, they have to be, you know, advised or educated without being demoralized right? And then the older ones can encourage the younger ones. I mean, it, it matters. I'm one of the older ones right at Lion now. And, the, and I have a really good relationship with the ones that are more recent, which is nice, partly because they're the age of my children. And so I kind of, I like that. I have mama karma. I like to think about, you know, those are like my kids and I want to be this nice old lady. <laughs> uh, sociability, rational pride, making sure you reward the people who really are making a better climate at work, going over and above what they can't do, what they have to, um, that you're encouraging ambition, right? If somebody, you can have hierarchical promotions, but you can have lateral promotions, right? Vertical promotions, lateral. Lateral would be that an employee uh, is bored with their job. They're good, but they want to learn something else. They're not going to necessarily get higher pay or higher status, but they just want to be more developed. So any kind of desire to develop yourself as an employee. I used to teach nights over at these colleges that are in a, in a, area that has 2 million people. And so companies would pay for workers to go back and get a bachelor's degree at night. So those would be motivated workers, right? It's a win-win. The college gets money, the company gets better employees, the money that they pay, somehow they think it either pays off literally or it's worth it because it raises the quality of life throughout the, the area all through the, the city. There's, if there's more educated people, if there's people who have all that discipline to work in the daytime and go to school at night, it's just self-discipline that they're exhibiting. It's ambition, healthy, you know, not competing against somebody else. But when you go back to college, it's just like you're telling the boss, I want to just keep developing as a person. And I think, you know, that's a win-win. Um, when workers are too ambitious, they create animosity. When they're not ambitious enough, uh, they sort of a drag, right, on everybody else. Um, find out who wants to promote themselves, develop themselves, and encourage them, uh, compliment them. High-mindedness, don't be petty or mean-spirited. That really matters, right? Keep everything in perspective. Know yourself. Don't overvalue or undervalue your virtues as a, as a manager or your weaknesses as a manager. Um, then within the company, you need to make it, I, I'm going to have, you're going to have to each have three points, okay? Uh, make a good set of rules and regulations, apply them fairly, enforce them equally, 
don't favor the more powerful, right? Tend to favor the less powerful. So you show the employees that you're not abusing your power. So sort of go out of your way. Set higher standards for the people at the top. They would get punished more if they make a mistake because it has more negative impact on other people. Um, pay them the pay, the salary, the benefits, right? Um, pay your share of taxes. Don't just hate taxes, right? Because companies aren't the be all and end all of a society. Society should exist to promote flourishing. And each sector, government, business, education, healthcare, each one of them contributes to the whole, but each one has to pay amount of taxes that go to people who are doing services that are dedicated to public health, public school, public parks, right? But don't resent that. Just, um, you know, say, of course, like, why would I not? I want my employees to know that their children are getting well educated, that the neighborhoods are safe, that they have parks to play in, that the roads uh, doesn't take them forever to get to work because there's decent roads. Um, you know, all this stuff, everybody depends on everybody. And just having that in your head, um, pay a worker, pay one worker to keep up on what's going on in the legislature and talk to the, to the politicians and do research about which laws are good or bad and listen to the legislator, give the legislator advice from the point of view of the educational system, the healthcare system, some aspect of the business culture. If those people would just talk to each other, we'd have a lot. I mean, it would the quality of life for everyone would be better. Um, what particular mix of private and public? And that's every day, there's a different answer to that question. And there's a different answer for every aspect of everyone's life. So um, don't overvalue business and um, acknowledge what government does. Don't undervalue business, but in our society, we tend to overvalue it. Um, become informed. And also that if you hire somebody to do that, they can send out a newsletter and inform the employees. So, um, and then the conclusion is that these are universal. You could take these notions and teach them and apply them in any country, right? It's, it's because they're based on our common humanity and our dependence on each other and on the fact that social evolution, we naturally evolve toward more and more complex social networks and political networks. And each generation has to do a good job of creating social and political networks and the fabric of society, you know, weaving people together, weaving uh, institutions and networks together so that they have a nice, you know, well, well made culture to pass on to their children. Um, all right. So, Jack, what stood out? Um, I liked what you were said about the, the boss that was paying for the night classes. Mm -hmm. That was really cool. I, I wish um, that would be more of a thing in America. Well, I'll tell you again, that's another urban rural problem, right? I mean, the big splits all over the world are urban and rural. So rural people don't have those opportunities because there aren't colleges around, you know? Yeah. Um, maybe online it will help, um, but it's, it's just very unfortunate how different these people's lives are. Yeah. Okay. Something else? Um, the abuses, like overcharging, I think that goes, that goes on a lot. Um, 
I guess like you could charge whatever you want for a product, but certain things like um, pharmaceuticals are, that's a big thing for me, like overcharging for um, a life-saving medicine. That's, that's horrible. Insulin is over, yeah. right? Actually, again, Amy Klobuchar, my senator, um, she has this huge book about antitrust. It started out because her daughter had a birth defect and there was a, you know, a, only one drug and the company had gotten a monopoly and it was way overpriced. And so she knew personally how this works. And if you don't have good health care, like <laughs> your baby can die mm -hmm. or you can get into huge debt. And it's just, um, and the companies can charge the government if you're on government, you know, and then uh, we go into debt. It, it's really dysfunctional. <laughs> uh, Mia. Ooh. I liked just talking about specifically when you said like, uh, like the ambition thing, like you can't like don't not to be overly ambitious because I think people think that, you know, if you're, especially if you're like in the realm of like goal setting, if you're setting this goal and it's just like sky high as, and you're just like a, I don't know, in the realm of like a brand new company or something like that, you're not going to more than likely, you're not going to be able to reach that. And that's going to overwhelm all of the workers too that, that are there. So I think it can create almost like a hostile, like very stressful environment. Where, so your workers aren't going to want to be there. But I like that because I don't know, I just think it's interesting. It's almost like not really controversial, but it's like, don't, if you're going to set a goal, make it realistic. Or if you're gonna, I mean, yeah, be, be realistic don't be overly ambitious I think that was the main thing I liked that one okay now what what you could think of and you could write in your post is that COVID what taking an advantage of COVID is that people have to reassess everything right so all of a sudden you have to be a lot more self-aware of the situation because it changed so much so four years ago you might have had a five-year goal for your company, right? And then what are you going to do? You're just going to get frustrated. Hey, I had my goal. Or if you just say, well, COVID, you know? And so you have to constantly be saying, well, what is realistic in this particular situation? And so if you want to think about or take advantage of the COVID situation, for being self-consciously aware of how you have to constantly reassess how can I actually flourish, mm -hmm. right? Because for example, Mia, you can't make expectations on yourself that you really, because of situation beyond your control, you can't meet that goal, right? And as professors, the administration tells us, you know, cut, cut some slack for the students, right? I, I don't have any problem with that. Mm -hmm. But then I have small classes, it's easier. If you have a whole lot of students, it's a lot harder to keep track of everybody. So, um, and you should remember that. Don't, don't criticize one professor because Dr. Beck isn't like that. No, no, <laughs> it, it can't be the same standard with a teacher that's got like 80 students right? There's no way. So again, that's another judgment call. So just learning how to think in terms of context and judgment calls, but also talking to other students in a way that's educational, that you aren't just complaining, right? Really think about it. You can, you know, you can say I'm under stress, I'm stressed, I'm stressed. Okay, you're not learning anything from saying that, right? So you say, okay, what's my situation? And then you can say, you can forgive yourself for being stressed, but don't resent the fact that you are because that just makes you more stressed, right? Okay, mm -hmm. just go, okay, I have this situation. I can't control that. I thought four years ago, I was gonna be here. I'm not there, but there's good reasons, right? So what? what actually were reasonable goals for me over the last two years? And have I achieved 
what is reasonable over those two years? Or when did I let COVID get to me and I underachieved? Or when did I fight against that and keep trying to pretend I could achieve at a level that I couldn't, right? I would just recommend that to you, just learning how to deliberate. And um, you could find a friend, right? Find somebody else to talk to in this way, because literally you're changing the way your brain works. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense to, to you all, to you, Jeff? It, it can be a really maturing experience. And I'm sure that when you apply for a job, I bet money that the boss will ask you, how did you deal with COVID? Because that's a good character test, right? I would, so I would definitely start now thinking about how am I dealing with COVID? Just imagine a boss asking you that question. And um, I mean, you could say, I didn't think about it until my professor, made, and now I think that here I did this, here I did that. Then I decided, geez, I better be a lot more conscientious. And then I got better at it. Does that make sense? It's so funny because it's just reflective consciousness. And we just forget that we all have it and we're just not using it. Isn't that sad? It's, don't you think that's kind of sad <laughs> that we have all these distractions that try to prevent us from doing it. And there it is, it's sitting right there. A kindergartner has it, you know? Yeah, and you definitely can't have a democracy unless people learn to do that. Because then people are at each other's throats and then there's chaos and then a power hungry person, I can fix it, I'll be the fixer. <laughs> and then you lose it. Anyway, so next time I wanted to show you, okay, I'm a minute over, but I'll tell you what I want to talk to you about next time, just at the beginning for a little while, is um, I did decide during COVID that I would do something I had not done um, before that I sort of always wanted to do. Um, Dang, I don't have it. Anyway, I read a lot of books about what's been going on since 1980 because I'm aware of it and I hear about it and I live through it. But I just sat down, I think I read 2,500 pages worth of books, okay? And then I scanned about 40 pages in each book and I wrote an outline. I wrote why. I care about this particular issue. And if and a student said this to me, this is what got me started. She said, how come nobody talks about important stuff? And I said, well, I do. <laughs> and so I started what's called a reading group if anybody wants to get together. Um, but I, uh, so I have, I don't know how many books, maybe, maybe 20 books. And, um, but I'm not gonna put you on it unless you ask. And also I, I had expected to put my out, just an outline, a little outline of the names of the books and why I thought they were important. And then if you wanted to go onto that site, you would tell me, but there's no pressure. Nobody says it in class to try to get brownie points. Um, if you wanted to, to meet, if another friend, right? Well, let me just give you one example. The hacking of the American mind. It's about how our diets are addictive. addictive. And he does all the body chemistry. And um, it's serious stuff. Uh, but anyway, so if you want to know that, and... Uh, Anyway, next time I'll tell you all the titles and you decide. But if you have a friend that you think is interested in the topic, uh, we can, you can tell me, I can invite them and we can meet, we can arrange to meet and have a conversation about that book or that reading. 
So that's what I'll do next time at the beginning, because I'm not going to put you on it until first I show you that outline. Um, and actually, I can post it. I'll send you an email and post it. But I'll also, no, I'll put it on the stream like I was supposed to. I'll put it on the stream. And you tell me, again, no brownie points. There's no political pressure. It's very important, right? Um, the things that matter to me might not be things that matter to you. And if you think they look biased, you can recommend something to me, truly. Um, so you can recommend a reading that you think you got, you know, what you thought was very different than this author. Um, and then you separate some of those authors have a political opinion, but it's based on the, the facts in the book. And so you have to separate the emotional aspects. Some of them are, the, the prose is emotional. You have to separate it from the fact. And that is, you need to get in that habit. You need to develop that habit. When I teach logic, I taught, we had these editorials and the students were just put off by the emotion but they need to not do that because the person had important facts. Um, so you have to cut through the crap, right? And anyway, all right, I'll let you go. And um, hopefully next time we'll get a few more people, but everything's posted. It's about women's rights next time. All right, bye-bye. See you, Dr. Beck.